spy scandal that's already rocked the White House, an intrigue that could threaten the presidency of George Bush. This story centers on incredible allegations of spying on a scale never before imagined. It involves America's Central Intelligence Agency selling computer programs to foreign nations. These programs allegedly allowed the CIA to spy on the intelligence agencies that bought it. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Here are the facts. In August of 1991, the corpse of journalist Danny Casolaro was found in the tub of Sheraton Hotel's room 517 in Martinsburg, West Virginia. He had 10 to 12 slash wounds on his wrist. Investigators also found a suicide note nearby. Coroners twice ruled the death a suicide. However, Casolaro's family believed there was more to the story. In the time leading up to his death, Danny Casolaro had become increasingly panicked. He told his brother that anonymous callers harassed and threatened him on the phone, which his housekeeper confirmed. Casolaro also told his confidants that if he died, it would not be a suicide. Instead, he implied, it would have something to do with his latest investigation, a massive conspiracy of silence touching on everything from surveillance software to the October surprise, Iran-Contra, and more, bridging generations and reaching all the way to the White House. Danny Casolaro called this conspiracy the octopus. Here's where it gets crazy. Today, most people have not heard of Danny Casolaro. What was he working on? What happened to him on the night of his death? According to witnesses, he was traveling to Martinsburg to meet with a contact, possibly regarding the now obscure Inslaw case. In the 1970s, an IT company named Inslaw developed a people tracking program called the Prosecutor's Management Information System, or PROMISE a data mining tracking system easily decades ahead of its time. The deal went sour, and Inslaw eventually took the Department of Justice to court, alleging that the United States did not honor the contract. Inslaw argued that the government pirated this software, sold it to other countries, and tried to bankrupt and silence their company to stop the truth from getting out. In contentious congressional proceedings, compelling evidence emerged to support these claims. As time passed, more and more witnesses came forth, including former Mossad Deputy Director Rafa Itan, who claimed that U.S. and Israeli intelligence agencies cooperated to sell a Trojan horse version of promise to foreign governments. It's possible that Casalero's investigation began here, but soon he stumbled into what he believed was an international web of espionage, assassination, drugs, illegal weapon trades, and more. He traced the ringleaders to the upper reaches of private security firms, the CIA, and the Reagan-era White House. Today, questions about the events persist and remain unanswered. Theorists have drawn increasingly complicated links between events alleged to be part of the octopus, but how much of this is mere conjecture? So the octopus, to a large extent, focused on the theft of the Inslaw software, which belonged to a couple called the Hamiltons in Washington, who developed this uh, case management software that was just the bee's knees at the time, and the Justice Department showed immediate interest in it, uh, in, in um, buying it and then developing it. And uh, they ended up, uh, in effect, stealing it from the Hamiltons and letting it loose all around the world to the Saudis, to the Israelis, to the Canadians. I mean, you name it, they had it. But mm. with this backdoor feature that allowed U.S. intelligence to be monitoring it, uh, anyway, so that's just the, the, the bare bones of the, uh, the Inslaw software connection. And, and there were many investigations, and they, they drew contrary conclusions as to whether the Justice Department really uh, acted with malfeasance here. Um, but to me, the, the matter is pretty much settled. And, and this document alone, which I'm going to read you about Khashoggi. Okay. Okay, here we go. This is dated May 16, 1985. 
It's addressed to William Weld, U.S. Attorney. It's signed by W. Bradford Reynolds, Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Rights Division. I'm going to first read the document and then comment on it. As agreed, Messrs. Manukur Gorbanifar, Adnan Khashoggi, and Richard Armitage will broker the transaction of Promise Software to Sheikh Khalid bin Mahfouz for resale re and, and, and general distribution, distribution as gifts gift in his in region he contingent upon the three conditions we last spoke of. Promise must have a soft arrival, no paperwork, customs, or delay. It must be equipped with the special data retrieval unit. As before, you must walk the financial aspect through Credit Suisse International Commercial Bank. If you encounter any problems, contact me directly. Wow. Um, and people should know that Khashoggi is best buddies with none other than Donald Trump. And this is going on at the time of these Iran arms dealings with the Israelis and the Reagan administration, arms for hostages with Iran, which later mushroomed to the Iran-Contra and then the drug connection on top of that. Um, so this is the time period, 1985. This is the part that astounds me. I was just thinking, someone's got to come along and tell me that this document is not real, that it's a forgery. What do I find out? Well, almost the opposite. I found out that Someone who's writing a book on former Attorney General Elliot Richardson, who is undoubtedly a white hat in this affair, one of the few Justice Department people who definitely, to my satisfaction, wears a white hat in this whole thing. He represented Vince Law, tried to get to the bottom of it, it what I can determine. Uh, this guy was writing a book about Richardson, and it never came out. But in the process of writing the book, he got a hold of this memo. And he showed it to William Bradford Reynolds to see whether he would authenticate it. And to his astonishment, Bradford Reynolds said, yes, he remembered it. And that he had signed it because, I forget whether it was Jensen or Meese. Meese was the Reagan's attorney general who had all these scandals under him, like WedTech and this one. Um, but also Jensen was another guy who, who was a dubious character who, who was working right under Meese. I forget whether... He was signing this on behalf of Jensen or Meese, but he said he signed this document. You remember signing it? And then he did it because Meese or Jensen was out of the office that day. And refresh my mind, the doc document says it. it, it this document it, it, instructs these nefarious people yeah. to conduct this very unorthodox transaction. And this is on Justice Department Civil Rights Division stationery. Now, I should add, the person who sent this to the Hamilton assured them that you're not going to find any copies of this document. They've been destroyed, but you've got this one. That's how it came to be released. And, and, and as I'm telling you, there's apparent partial confirmation. Now, I spoke to Michael Best. At quite, at, we spoke about before, but Michael Best, this just incredible archivist, just been uploading all these documents, whether about the Kennedy assassination, the Walker shooting, the, the CIA, uh, all um, – or this octopus scandal, he's just unloaded, just apparently uploaded a million files or something, something just staggering amount. And he's uploading and them to archive, archive.com, it's called, archive.org, what is it? He's got a bunch of them. One is Glomar Disclosure, one is That One Archive, the T-H-A-T, the number one archive. He's got them archived several different places. Um, I'm going to refer in a while to the Facebook one, which is Glomar Disclosure, because that's going to be pertinent to some of the things we bring up, I believe. Okay. Especially if you bring, bring up things like Foster. Um, so anyway, he has said, yes, okay, he agrees with me that, yes, this has been partly authenticated, but that we shouldn't, you know, get too dizzy about it because that isn't a complete authentication. And I agree. You know, one person's recollection, maybe he has an axe crime, maybe, you know, Maybe he, who knows, maybe he wants to get back on the, oh, yeah, that's true. You know, who knows what, so, um, or maybe he's seen out. Who knows what's going on with the right. panel? But, but it's not full confirmation. But William Wells, did I mention that he's on the vice presidential, he's the vice presidential nominee for the Libertarian ticket under Gary Johnson? That guy? Yes. 
William <laughs> Wells. So the guy who this is addressed to, I can't, this is just amazing. The guy who this is addressed to is the libertarian candidate, libertarian vice presidential candidate. And that's, you know, Johnson is getting more attention than Jill Stein, I can assure you. Yeah. Uh, not that either of them are really going to get him much. But. I can probably get well Weld on the show. <laughs> I left a message. They, 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 there was a, on Facebook, they left a phone number. So I left a message. I left okay. my name and number. I didn't say why I was calling. But this is my question for William Weld. Uh, do you remember this letter? And is this the standard way you were conducting business, routine business, or was it not routine business? at the Justice Department when you were working there. Um, because this is really just, and this just reeks of being a smoking gun. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I bet you, too, I bet you the National Enquirer would publish that right now because uh, cause Weld is splitting the uh, Trump's vote, and, and Trump got them in, in his pocket. Uh, wait, Trump's, wait, say that again? Uh, Trump's got the National Enquirer in his pocket. There's no doubt about oh. that. Yeah. yeah, but he has no interest in going after the Libertarian candidates, does he? Well, sure, because the, the, the Weld is splitting the Trump vote. All, all the conservatives are going – if they don't go to Trump, they're going to go to Weld and, and the libertarians. So it would be in Trump's interest if he wasn't just throwing this whole thing in the bag. Who, who the hell knows at this point because it's so bizarre and crazy. Who, who knows what's going on? Well, with this? I, I think you know because the choir kept pushing the Ted Cruz with Lee Harvey Oswald. Ted Cruz is father with Lee Harvey Oswald. Right. So they're kind of tainted with these uh, presidential scandals if you ask me. No, I don't, they think don't. They, they, I don't think they would, they would hesitate in a second to go with this. Um, now, now, you said something I to I think him. you're wrong. Okay. This is a well, career killer. But it might not, you know, who knows? They, they could be bold enough to do it. We've got to get it uh, out there. But it might be too obscure for the average uh, supermarket tabloid reader. Yeah, because they only know. Stuff. And, They'd have to explain so much background, wouldn't they? True, because they only know of Khashoggi from Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. You know? but now, and, Khalid bin Mahfouz, do you know who he is? He's like the leading guy in BCCI. He's like a superpower among the Saudis. He may be dead now. I don't know. But he is so important. And then he's linked here with, with Gorbanifar and Khashoggi in the secret transaction where the, the back door must be included in the promised software. And these financial aspects must be walked through. Uh, I think it said as before. Yes, as before. So he's done it before. Weld has done this before. Oh, wow. Walks the financial aspects through Credit Suisse into the National Commercial Bank. If you encounter any problems, contact me directly. So I th I don't know if I – I think I did ask Michael Best whether he had contacted William Weld. I don't I don't think he answered me. Uh, he did answer a lot of my questions, though. My name is Indira Singh. I live and work um, at Ground Zero. On the morning of, sep of September the 11th, I was supposed to be on the 106th floor of the World Trade Center at a risk conference that a company by the name of Risk Waters was putting on. I was late that morning. In many ways, I think that my life was spared, and I get to do this today on their behalf. It is my privilege to think that. Um, I am a... I, prior to 9-11, I was a civilian EMT, and when the planes hit, I called my job and I said I had just turned into an EMT. I changed my clothes and I headed down to the site. As night fell on September 11, 2001, I was on triage duty on the edge of the pile. That's a picture of me. Um, I think I had been injured at that point, but I was not a happy camper. None of us were because we, a lot of us were wondering where all the help was. Those of us who were right on the pile were in dire straits. In any case, um, rescue workers transported, were transporting body parts as fast as they could, wherever they could, mainly to the triage sites, and they were placing what they found anywhere, including on the floor next to me. It was clear to me, and I'm sorry I have to make this graphic, but the truth 9-11 has been so sanitized, I think it, it needs to be understood that most had, had died horrific deaths. And we were seeing evidence of what some had been through on the flights. I made a promise to something I saw there that if anything fell into my lap, 
I would not look the other way. I would do whatever I could to prevent such a horror from happening again. After a week, I returned fairly injured to what was left of my contaminated neighborhood and my life. I had a good life. I did risk at J.P. Morgan Chase. Just to take a break from all the heavy stuff, what I do um, was to devise a way to monitor everything going on in a very large company to stop big problems from happening. There is that little cloud there and my very bizarre picture of how I uh, think about this problem. It's, I am a person who was merging two disciplines, risk management and something called enterprise architecture, which is um, fairly esoteric, but at the end of the day, we seek to prevent large problems from happening anywhere in a large global enterprise. At JP Morgan, I was working on the next generation risk blueprint, which is all about how to prevent these things from happening, bad business practice such as money laundering, road trading, and massive computer failures, anything you could imagine would go wrong. I had a lot of leeway consulting as a senior risk architect to think out of the box and actually get my ideas implemented. I was funded out of a strategic fund, I reported to the directors, and I was pretty happy. JP Morgan thought very highly of me, and they were thinking of funding in conjunction with my project in DC, the next generation risk software. What I needed to do, what I did, was a really smart piece of software. Really, really smart. Um, its job would be to think about all the information. And this is, where I, this is where you may connect a dot. The job of this software would be to think about all the information that represented what was going on in the enterprise at any given time as bank business was being transacted worldwide. For example, it would, it's a, it would be a surveillance software that would look for trading patterns that, in, that indicated someone was up to no good and then do something about it. Send a message somewhere, send the transaction information somewhere, perhaps shut their system down, perhaps shut another system down, perhaps start something else up elsewhere. This kind of capability is very, very essential in today's world. However, this kind of software is not found in Microsoft or not even in IBM. A small group of very esoteric software companies make this kind of enterprise software and it is very pricey. So you can't afford to pick wrong. And I asked all my colleagues who are industry gurus, what would they recommend for this? My buddies recommended p -Tech. And my buddies and JP Morgan were also evaluating P-TECH. And why not P-TECH? What you see on the screen is a list, is a very prestigious list of P-TECH's client. P-TECH is a very small software company located in Quincy, Massachusetts. Um, they put out this kind of software product that I was talking about, and it has an artificial intelligence core. P-TECH assured me that they had something called clearances, so I figured there'd be no problem getting them clear to come into J.P. Morgan Chase to evaluate our very confidential risk plans for the future, how we would stop money laundering in the future, for instance. IBM told me that they were planning on making P-TECH a special global partner. With IBM standing next to the small vendor P-TECH, I was pretty excited that I was on the right track. There was no problem getting P-TECH cleared through security to come visit and talk serious business. They were with me for 20 minutes before I suspected something was not, not right. So I called my colleagues. They told me to talk to ex-P-TECH and P-TECH employees right away, but they told me something even more ominous. They said, do not let them out of your sight and don't let them take anything from the bank. So, with P-TECH people standing still feet away from me, they told me a hair-raising story of P-TECH's myriad connections to terrorism. First, to the person you see in this picture who was placed on the U.S. terror list in October 2001. His name is Yasin Qadi, a Saudi businessman. It's the one the arrow is pointing towards. I thought these people were kidding or they were setting up a play for P-TECH's business with J.P. Morgan. I insisted on proof and documentation I went to two states to collect it, including this and other pictures. I also spoke with the Boston FBI, where they said they had reported this nine months earlier, just weeks after the attack. 
This was the end of May 2002. At the very same time, I am discovering this about PTEC because their meeting with me and J.P. Morgan Chase was at the ending of May. At the very same time, on May 30, 2002, Agent Robert Wright of the Chicago FBI at a congressional hearing appeared on the steps of the Capitol and burst into tears apologizing to the 9-11 families, stating his investigation into terrorism financing had been repeatedly shut down and he had been censured for pushing it. Actually, his investigation was exactly into Yasin Qadi, whom he called bin Laden's banker. Wright's investigation was shut down in the late 90s. He stated if he had been able to continue and shut down the funding to Al-Qaeda, 9-11 may not have happened. His original quote was, it would not have happened. When you show up to work within line of sight of Ground Zero and shake hands with some group the FBI agents said had financed it, what exactly is the playbook? And there was more, like the Ginsu knife commercial. For me, something big had fallen into my lap. I had to make some decisions. Agent Wright said his investigation into the founders and financiers of PTEC and their financing shell, something called BMI, was also shut down. Well, BMI, which is in the first column, stands for Baitul Mal, which later turned out to be a front for Hamas and Al-Qaeda. Little uh, interesting point here, Governor Kane did a $24 million land deal with a sub of BMI, 3% of which of the commission went back to um, BMI, and uh, around the same time, some of his New Jersey citizens were being blown up in Israel by Hamas. I do not say that allegedly because um, this has been reported in a Department of Treasury uh, report which happened to fall into my hands. The people who started BMI were exactly the same who started PTEC and in fact, the chief scientist was the one I shook hands with uh, just uh, when, I, when, I, when they came down to J.P. Morgan Chase. In fact, he was the one who made me suspicious based on some behavior that he was exhibiting at J.P. Morgan. In addition, there were references to a recent raid in Herndon, Virginia, a key target of which was Yakub Mirza and his many organizations that were accused of being terror charity friends to Al-Qaeda. Yakub Mirza was on the board of PTEC. I demanded proof of that and got it. So far, we're up to three names, but wait, there's more. I went down to meet a group of the PTEC and ex-PTEC employees in uh, Virginia. I wanted to see them face to face and have them tell me this horrific story to my face and have them write down in their own hand uh, what they were telling me and to provide documentation. And they did. I asked the Boston FBI to send me something that was proof this company had the terrorism connections they claimed it did and the person there did. The PTEC employees kept going on. They kept drawing diagrams for three or four days until I, I was convinced this was something out of a Tom Clancy novel. If what indeed they were saying was true, this company needed to be stopped now before they did damage elsewhere. By the time they were finished drawing their diagrams, there were 17 names linked to terrors. The glaring question was, why wasn't PTEC shut down? Was there an ongoing investigation? Did the FBI just not get it? Or was someone being protected? What do you do when the Boston FBI tells you, Indira, you are in a better position than I am to get real documentation on the situation with PTEC, so please keep doing what you're doing? Who do you call? <coughs> Welcome, my friends. Welcome to episode 45 of the Corbett Report, PTEC and the 9-11 software. Today's episode features information that comes from corporate whistleblower Indira Singh. Regular listeners to the Corbett Report might remember Indira Singh from episode 31, Welcome to 9-11 Truth. In that audio documentary, we featured a clip from Indira Singh's presentation to the Citizens Commission on 9-11. If you want to refresh yourself with that information, please listen to episode 31 of the Corbett Report, starting at 16 minutes and 31 seconds, 
and ending at 27 minutes and 36 seconds. That clip, which we featured in that earlier episode of the Corbett Report, featured some of Indira Singh's startling testimony about the information that she gleaned when she was working at J.P. Morgan Chase. Singh was hired as a consultant for J.P. Morgan Chase to develop the next generation of business architecture enterprise software. The software she was seeking to implement at J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the largest financial institutions in the world, was a specialized cutting-edge risk architecture software that would essentially be artificially intelligent and capable of scanning through the millions of transactions taking place across the J.P. Morgan Chase institution in real time, monitoring these transactions for suspicious activity such as rogue trading, and would then be able to alert the proper people within the J.P. Morgan institution to the problem and potentially even stop the transactions from taking place. The importance, sensitivity, and sophistication of any such software necessarily led Ms. Singh to seek out the true leaders in the enterprise architecture software industry. Her research and due diligence into the issue led her to a company called p -Tech. As the senior risk management consultant for one of the largest financial institutions in the world, Ms. Singh knew to trust credible, proven sources of third-party software. That's why p -Tech's roster of clients immediately put them in the top echelon of software providers. p -Tech's clients included some of the most sensitive organizations and agencies in the United States government, including NATO, the U.S. Armed Forces, Congress, the Department of Energy, the Department of Justice, the FBI, Customs, the FAA, the IRS, the Secret Service, and the White House. This sterling roster of clients made Indira Singh very eager to take a look at p -Tech's software. However, when the p -Tech representatives arrived at the J.P. Morgan Chase offices to display and present their software, Miss Singh knew there was something wrong right away. Today we're going to do something that we haven't done since episode 20 of the Corbett Report, which featured a presentation by Webster Tarpley on the 9-11 drills. Regular listeners to the Corbett Report will remember Webster Tarpley's lecture from episode 20 on the 26 war games and drills that Webster Tarpley has identified as taking place on or around 9-11 that directly affected the U.S. Air Force's ability to counteract the hijackings that day. That was one of the key talks to get people into the deep research through which they can come to a more informed understanding of the operational aspects of 9-11 as an inside job. Likewise, the interview that we're about to present with Indira Singh gives a more informed, more detailed account of what was really taking place on 9-11 and the software that was used to help bring that about. This is an extremely important interview for anyone interested in the serious, deep research into 9-11 and is an excellent starting point from which to begin a deeper investigation of that day. I heartily recommend that my listeners check out this interview in its entirety. And again, please go to the documentation list on corporatereport.com for a link to the original source file of this audio interview so you can listen to it in its entirety. Today I present an extended audio extract from this interview conducted by Bonnie Faulkner of KPFA's Guns and Butter in 2005. This extract begins with Indira Singh explaining what happened when p -Tech arrived in her office. Well, they came a little late. Immediately there were some issues with how the day would proceed. For instance, they showed up without the agreed-on software in hand. The most important thing about it is that their chief scientist, Dr. Hussein Ibrahim, came. He's an Egyptian-American, and he had a, a very good reputation in the field, very bright, someone you would like working with, very knowledgeable. But they had showed up without the software, and what I had done was isolated a workstation to get off the net. After all, we were testing uh, whether the software would meet our criteria, and if I had said it did, then that would be a big deal if it subsequently couldn't. So I needed to 
start with an out-the-box version of PTAC. They didn't bring that, and Dr. Abraham said, that's not a problem. We can develop the demo on his laptop. And if you know anything about these things, that's like a no-no, because at the end of the day, he's walking out the door, and I don't have anything. And he's walking away with pretty much enough of how we're thinking about doing operational risk. Now, operational risk is about how to spot bad things that are going on in a financial institution, things like rogue trading, money laundering, and so on and so forth. And it's very subtle. Our intellectual property, at least what J.P. Morgan was hiring me for, was to think innovatively out of the box in the next generation. How do you proactively design a blueprint to spot these things? And that's pretty big. He's definitely, people are smart enough to get an idea. Oh, they're thinking of going down this road. That's a big deal. So I was a risk person, so I'm very aware of not to expose our intellectual property or that of the company I am consulting for. I'm very protective of that. So they showed up without the software, and um, that was a huge enough red flag that I began paying attention to them. A couple other things went on, and within half an hour, I just walked over to the same people who had recommended them and began calling, and I said to one of them, I have the PTAC people here, and the reaction was not the reaction I would have ever expected. It was, what are they doing on site? And I said, well, you recommended them. And they said, no, um, you should have come through a distributor, an American distributor. And I said, uh-uh, J.P. Morgan reserves a right to work directly with the company, and besides which they are are a preferred vendor of IBM, their preferred vendor program, and that's the way we work. We don't work through small distributors. If we're going to go with this software as a standard, we're going to go right to the source and make the agreements there. So I said, what is the problem? And uh, basically this person said, don't let them out of your sight. And that's when my stomach sank. So you have to understand how all of a sudden I'm beginning to see these people in a different way because when they said, don't let them out of your sight, I have a Middle Eastern company there and we're taught not to discriminate. And that was not something that I was about to do. And uh, to prove that they were there being evaluated. So that is never, uh, you know, going to be a bone of contention, although later people made that an issue. But if I had a problem working with a Middle Eastern company, they would have never been there in the first place, much less before Ground Zero closed. And no problem whatsoever having them up there. I like the idea. What do you mean uh, PTEC was a Middle Eastern company? Well, that's what subsequently was revealed in the phone call, that their financier, their funders, their investors were all Saudis.